unwanted, unloved, unlovable, not seen, not heard, invisible. A little spoiler alert. These are some of the words people use to describe their experience of childhood emotional neglect. I'd like to introduce you to Zoe and Hal. These are not their real names, by the way. They're going to tell you their stories, and I'm going to slip in a few explainers here and there. At the end, I'll tell you about some resources and where you can get help if you've been personally affected by this film. Let's hear from Zoe first. It's hard to think of it as neglect, because my parents were so concerned to do the right thing. But there was, there was just this feeling that I always had, this feeling that I wasn't loved, that I wasn't wanted. And I used to think that's because I was unlovable. Actually, I don't want to go home and see my parents. It's not a matter of time. I can find time if I want it. But they never found time for me when I was a kid, so why should I for them now? And it's not kind of a revengeful thing, it's just that I don't feel it anymore. I don't feel the need for any of this. And it's when my mum says to me, oh, we FaceTime, you know, and she says to me, oh, but we really miss you, why don't you come home? And it's like, I feel like an empty shell. But I remember very early, I remember a photograph being taken and, well, I must have been two or three and Mum not wanting me to sit on her knee. When I used to see other people with, with their families, they were always so warm, so affectionate. I mean, their, their, their dads would cuddle them and their Mum would, well, their Mum would kiss and cuddle them. There was none of that. Mum actually apologised to me recently for, for not being, oh, what did she say? She wasn't, oh, you know, she never used to hug me or anything. She said that her mum was the same with her. I mean, I don't remember how old I was when my dad last told me he loved me. I don't have any memory of him, you know, touching my head or playing with my hair affectionately or telling me, you know, you're my good boy or kissing or cuddling me. I have no memory of any of this. Can you imagine? And I can still see its impact in my life, in my adult relationships. Being lovingly held is one of the most important experiences for an infant. Being held lovingly and loving looks and smiles actually help a baby's brain to grow. Very young children need an adult who is consistently emotionally available and responsive or tuned in to their needs. Without this, babies can't develop a normal, healthy response to stress. Yet in Western society, leaving a distressed baby to cry it out is still common practice and even recommended by some parenting gurus. In fact, babies seem to become most distressed when their main caregiver, whether that's mum or someone else, is physically present but emotionally absent. And, um, so as I say, my dad was very critical, but there was no affection there. No affection, care, nothing. So I was always going to my, my mum. I was too dependent on my mum. But she wasn't always consistently there either. Physically, she was there. But she was always somewhere else. Her mind was always somewhere else. So I had a lot of freedom. My dad was working all the time, and my mum was at home. But she always left me to it. When it comes to buying presents, you know, I try and think of something that she'll like. But there's a lot of rejection there. There was a lot of rejection for my dad as well. He bought a lovely coat one year. It was in a long box, and he was so pleased. But it ended up in an argument because she, well, not that she didn't like it, but she said it was a waste of money and she rejected it. I mean, she did wear it. But I felt for my dad. My dad has these cuts in his arms, very big cuts, this long, 35 centimetres, five or six or more, just like that. And you know, 
I've um, I've only just realised recently that this is most likely self harm, self induced more than anything else. But when I was a child, I just took it as as it was. I never asked him. I remember a couple of years ago, I did ask him, "What happened to your arms? What is that?" He never answered. And it wasn't just once. It was at least five or six times. And he never answered and explained. And I said, why would you do that? Why would you do that to yourself? And he, and he just changed the subject. But I've heard how my granddad was towards my dad. He was quite an abusive person as well. And he, I think if I'm correct, my dad has experienced more childhood neglect than I ever have. When I was a child at school, I was probably about eight. And you know why you have childhood squabbles at school. And I came back one day and I avoid telling her things even today. And I don't know whether it's from this, but I told her, you know, you, you tell your mum someone's being horrible to you. And I can remember her saying to me, well, what's wrong with you? Why don't people like you? And that has stayed with me. If your parent rejects you, especially when you're upset, you may not know where to turn for help. For a young child, there's nowhere else to go other than inwards with the anxiety and hurt. Typically, children who are emotionally neglected learn not to seek comfort or safety when they're upset or frightened. When their parents criticise, belittle and humiliate them, children often begin to feel defective and ashamed and may eventually come to think of themselves as simply unlovable and without worth. Anyway, things really didn't go well between my mum and my dad. And so I remember at one point my mum was planning to leave home she never did, but she was planning it. She was packing a bag. I was like, I don't know, maybe 12. And I remember that for days, I was begging her to take me. And if she left home, I remember very clearly, every morning I would wake up. And I remember when I woke up, the first thing I would do was check whether my mom was at home. Can you imagine how traumatic it was? Mum prides herself still, prides herself on not showing emotion. She actually said, I don't do emotion, said with great pride. I think for a long time I, I tried to make her love me, but she was always like the carrot on the end of a stick, always just out of reach, you know. I thought, if I just try harder, I'll be able to, to reach that carrot. But I never was going to reach it. It was always just out of reach. So one of the losses that I, I think I've experienced in childhood is that my own ability to be loving and giving wasn't welcomed, wasn't accepted. I, I lost that opportunity to be loving and giving, you know? So I never had that feeling of connection. And I only realised this very recently because I had such a fear that my partner would leave me. And she was like, okay, wait a second, why are you acting in this way? And we started talking about childhood, and when you join the dots, then I can see how, actually, this is just a reflection of what happened to me in my childhood. Because I was scared of losing mum. And, I mean, she didn't do it on purpose. It was just the circumstances she was in. But she never promised me, and... She never promised me that she would take me. And then I was tried to like please her, to show her that I'm a good boy. So when I look back now, I can see like actually, my mom didn't have the best experience of marriage, and um, she was emotionally, sometimes, most of the time, she was emotionally unavailable. Most parents don't intend to harm their child, although harm is clearly often caused. Sometimes, parents are not able to be sensitive to their child's needs because they are overwhelmed by their own problems 
such as mental ill health, including postnatal depression, substance abuse, or stressful work commitments. Dad was very stressed with the business, so he really struggled with us. He was very, well, he was on edge. I don't think he quite had a mental breakdown, but he was very close to it, very depressed. So that was around. So my recollection is that I, I grew up being quiet. It could be amusing for a bit, but you couldn't complain about anything. And you couldn't be really happy because that would wind him up. And you couldn't be silly because that was awful, being silly. And you'd be stupid because that was beneath contempt. You know, I cannot remember, and I thought about this, and I can't remember any stage in my childhood being with a family and feeling particularly happy. I mean, there must have been a lot of occasions when it was you know, neutral, but I just can't remember us ever doing anything together, you know, when I thought, you know, this is a happy time that I'm having, but I can remember quite a lot of occasions when I was unhappy, <sighs> and that came to a head when I was, I think I was maybe 14, the last time I went on a family holiday with them, and I can remember distinctly thinking to myself, I've got another seven years of being controlled by these people and feeling, feeling really depressed by that. But if I ever did anything well, so if I did well at school, which I did, you know, I learned to read very quickly, I was top of the class all the way through, blah, blah, blah. That was very much praised, and particularly in public. Didn't Zoe do well? Doesn't Zoe play the piano beautifully? Zoe, play us something! Like a performing monkey. And you know, I used to, and I think it's not unusual really for teenagers, but I used to sleep a lot, simply because I was happier asleep. And waking up, I remember actually feeling depressed about the situation. I mean, that is a distinct memory. Waking up was always, you know, and that's a feeling that I've never had since. Waking up was bringing back all the unhappiness, a sort of heavy feeling, and worse than that sometimes. Once or twice I did think about the possibility of suicide, but not, um, you know, I never got anywhere near actually planning it. And I was incredibly well behaved. I was incredibly good. I never rebelled. I just thought I had to please her, you know? All the other kids apparently hated me. I mean, they don't hate me now. We get on perfectly well now. But they say that when we were growing up, you were so bloody perfect, it was like, God, I can't do anything because Zoe's already done it better. And I don't know that I was trying to do it for me. But I think I was always trying to do anything to get my mum to be pleased with me. But at the same time, I think there's been a real sort of fear, a real fear of, of ever claiming anything positive for myself, you know? Not daring to claim to be good or to have any positive attributes. And I'm not really quite sure where that fear comes from, except a, a cultural or historical taboo like getting too big for your own boots, or don't get cocky. But what I do distinctly remember feeling is we were walking along the street as a family, and it was just the feeling of, this is going to go on for another seven years. In fact, it didn't, because I mean, I tried to be out of the family as much as possible, and as I got older, it got easier, because I could do things at school you know, join things and go to those. And I spent a lot of time on my bike, cycling around the countryside, um, or just in my own head reading. And it felt like there was a lot of resentment in the house growing up. And so that affects your kind of self-worth. There was quite a lot of shouting. And a few occasions of I wish I'd never had you. And the rages. 
I remember hiding in the wardrobe with the rages. But that was quite normal. Sometimes I think maybe she just wasn't ready to be a mum. I always felt like I arrived too soon. In some ways I think she was probably quite uncertain and insecure. So she's kind of almost given me like, like the parent role. Kind of, be grown up, don't be any trouble, be responsible. So I always used to joke we were like absolutely fabulous, that relationship. The adult role was definitely on more on my side than hers, though. I mean, it wasn't so much that they made me do things, but basically, I always felt like I was expected to just sit in the corner and not be a nuisance and not cost them money, too, because I think they were a bit tight about money. So um, their aim for me was to be as invisible as possible and not to say anything and to do anything that would cause any problems. In some cases, emotional neglect may occur when children are exposed to confusing or traumatic events and interactions, such as domestic violence or a parent's suicide or attempted suicide. Emotionally, for my parents was mainly my dad. My mum was never really that horrible. It was that um, he was. He used to compare me to all the other kids and I don't think he realised what kind of impact that actually had on me when I was growing up. Because he still does it to this day, to be honest. He keeps on reminding me, oh, this guy's doing this now, or that guy's a lawyer here. And I'm like, I don't care. I just want to do what I want to do. He seems to think other people's success is what I should be judged on. That's one thing that I've always felt. But no one was aware of what was going on at home. It was so hidden. And I think it was perhaps the money overshadowed what was really going on, you know? It's shocking, shocking really, how it never got noticed, to be perfectly honest. But I guess it wasn't as visible as a bruise or greasy hair or being smelly. And growing up, I never had sense, any sense of, um, I think, there was nowhere. I don't remember anywhere, that sense of having a refuge or somebody to turn to at all for comfort, you know? I think that sense of isolation was very strong. That w there wasn't any, there was no comfort, no little safe harbour, no security in life, and um, I suppose I, I learned to be completely self-reliant. But there was, there was always this, oh, this is going back. I, I'm sorry, I'm being very random. But I, I, I said to my grandmother once when I was down with mum, why does mum sleep so much? Because she always used to sleep if she wasn't working. She used to be in bed and obviously looking back, that's depression, isn't it? Or I would wake up and hear her crying. And that used to upset me more than anything, that endless crying. I do remember the feeling, this isn't right, this isn't normal, and I wish she was better. I mean, I love my grandparents, that's just the happiest times I can remember as a child. My mother used to take us once a week, every Thursday, and seeing my grandmother, my grandfather, would still have been working then, and I loved them. I mean, they treated me really nicely. And sometimes I went to stay with them. And I think that was the happiest times as a child. <laughs> because they were really treated me well. And uh, I used to cry when I left. I remember that. A supportive person, such as a grandparent or a neighbour, may act as an emotional lifesaver for the developing child. There was just no kind of sense of there being anywhere, a safe place to go, any kind of refuge. Although, by the time I was older, I do remember I actually had a kind of a little place that I went to where there was a bit of woodland with a little stream running through. There was a little place there with a sort of tree growing over it. And there was a little hidden place completely hidden in a hollow. So nobody could find you there unless they actually were there. So it was a sort of hidden little place. And I remember having that sense of that kind of being a refuge place. But obviously, 
There were no people there. <laughs> I mean, I think the overall impression or feeling of what it was like for me as a child was constantly feeling unsure. Um, unsure of what was expected of me, what I was supposed to do, how I could... Because looking back, there's a very strong impression that I had to earn um, love and, well, maybe it wasn't love, um, kind of acceptance. I had to do something in order to earn it. And as it were, I had to perform. What I'm left with is this confusion. Because my mum will say things. She'll talk as if we're best friends and as if we're really close and as if everything's lovely. But her actions didn't match what she said. It's like mum's wanting. It's like she's needing. She feels needy. She needs this kind of response from me. And what she's doing is she's kind of looking for, and that's my sense of it as an adult. And I think as a child, I had that sense that my kind of place, as it were, was to fulfill her emotional needs. That's the feeling I have now. But of course, as a child, it was just a sort of overwhelming sense of insecurity and unease. And I suppose fear as well. So I guess that's kind of had a lasting effect. The unease, that kind of sense of being in company and of I became aware of this quite recently. Really not being able to just be relaxed and enjoy the company of other people. Dad always lived for work. He was a very ambitious man. He was never really around through our childhood. I mean, a lot of my friends' fathers, they were workers, maybe around a bit more often than mine. But he was never really the kind of dad that would have a kick around with my brothers or play fight or read stories in bed. We never really had any of that. I can't actually remember Mum doing any of that either. While I was playing, Mum was very much, you know, a homemaker. She was cooking and cleaning and that. And she thought she was being a good mum because she fed and clothed me and you know everything was clean, so she wasn't a bad mother. But I remember spending an awful lot of time alone. So as a child I was very lonely. And I can remember having friends to play as I got a little bit older. I was never allowed to go and play at their house because Mum was very protective. But if I had friends to play, I never wanted them to go home. I can remember holding onto the door handle and blocking the door, not wanting them to go. Um, and I think that impacts me even now. I can see it. I mean, even relationships with other people, I can see when that happens. So, for example, in the past, my partner used to say, you just can't bear the thought of somebody being upset with you. And, and it's true. I can't. I just, well, I can a bit more now. Because I understand, even though I have that feeling, I can cope with it. Even if I realise what's happening, but for years I just couldn't. If somebody was to just, was just upset for a moment, I just, I just had that urge to do something to sort of sort it out sort the problem out, and obviously it's all connected to what my parents used to do. I'll put others first. Well, in fact, I, I'm a lot less like it now than I was. But I've spent my whole life thinking that everybody was more important than me. And for years, I could never make decisions. My whole life's been decided on the toss of a coin. But I... I believe that the things my parents did to me at the as a child, I tend to do to myself now, so I've kind of internalised it. Like, for example, Dad tended not to take me seriously, and I find it very difficult to take myself seriously. I tend to dismiss what I'm doing. I don't think I really had a voice thinking about it. I can't remember being heard, and I just remember feeling like, like totally invisible. And I've realised that I don't notice myself. So I'd definitely say that my upbringing had a massive impact on my self-esteem, massively. I'm always kind of aware of, you know, what do other people think of me? Am I okay? Am I accepted? I just have no self-worth. That's a real big issue for me. And I think this is how they emotionally blackmail me. You use that word, and I think it's the right word. 
whenever they wanted something from me, they would start being upset. They would be like, oh, we're not going to talk to you. And I remember when I was a very small child, like five or six years old, I would just go to my parents and say, could you please just talk to me? Please do something. And they would be like, nothing. They would just ignore me. And I think that kind of created a very, very bad feeling in me. And I remember that they said, we're not gonna, um, we're not gonna beat you. So we're not causing harm. You'll just be punished. So the punishment was, we're not talking to you. Which was, which for me was, I remember going to them and saying, could you please beat me? And don't, don't do that. I mean, until I was in my late teens or early 20s, I just used to think, well, if my mother can't love me, who can? Oh, my bruises were inside. And I used to wish in some ways that she just hit me. I wish there were bruises because I was desperate for somebody to... <laughs> it sounds ridiculous. I was desperate for somebody to take me into care. I was so miserable. I was so unhappy. When I was, oh, I must have been about 10, I think, 10 or younger, I remember lying, I, I had a cabin bed, looking out of the window, just thinking, is somebody gonna come and rescue me? I was just so unhappy, and I felt so completely unloved. But now, I'm trying to like, overcome its consequences in my daily life. Because the past is the past. I can't change it. But now I'm trying to like change its impact on me. Like this attachment problem or anger problem, stuff like this. And in the future, I'm aware of this. I didn't have the best father figure. So in the future, if I consider having a family, I really want to go to like, I want to go to a counselor. I want to go to a, I don't know, a group therapy group um, or something and I feel I want to learn it from scratch because I really don't want to be someone like my dad at all and if there is a possibility that I'd be like him I prefer not to have any kids because I don't want to I don't want any young children any young people to hate me and have me ruin their life I think I learned eventually not to notice, not to feel my own feelings, which I think was making me emotionally cold. A lot of people have said that as I'm grown up, that I'm, well, especially my dad, I'm unaffectionate, I'm distant, I put barriers up. You were never an affectionate child, Zoe, you know? You've always come across as quite prickly, quite distant. For some children, it may feel like the only way to survive emotionally is by being strong, unaffected by feeling, independent, self-reliant, self-contained and without compassion. Such children may learn to keep either themselves or others at an emotional distance and learn to be watchful and vigilant. But it's a sort of compulsive self-reliance, a feeling of, I'm on my own with this, I've got to manage, I can't ask for help. I feel like asking for help is just not allowed. Just, you know, I've got to handle this. So it's a compulsion not to upset anybody, not to complain, not to be demanding, not to have any needs or wants. And for a long time, I felt like I didn't have any. I didn't have any. I was just so nothing. I had this conversation recently with my brother. He has the best relationship with his sons. And I was like, how do you manage this? I, has, I said to him, like, I'm really surprised that you have such a great relationship with your sons. Because you know, we never saw this. How have you managed this, man? I said this to my brother, you know. Because it's, it's not the, let's say, the example we saw. It's not the role model we saw. It's not the father figure we used to. 
he loves his sons, which is great, you know? And he shows it. It's just... the, the most important thing is he shows it, you know? And that's the important part. And I look at his sons, my nephews, and they're so cute. And they're, like, so lovable. I was like them, you know, so why didn't my dad show love to me? Uh, that's the frustration. I never really relaxed. I feel like when I'm out in the world, I have to be really defensive and I really need to have my guard up. I think that's why I struggle to make friends as well, because I'm, I'm more suspicious of everyone. So in relationships, it takes me a long time and I still find myself questioning well, I don't know, but more, probably more often than average. Are you sure you still love me, you know? Are you sure you want to be with me? So I do think I, I probably need reassurance more often than the average person. People who have not had all their emotional needs met in childhood may, when they become adults, stick to low-key, unsatisfactory relationships, making few demands of their partner out of a fear that they'll be abandoned very difficult to, to stand up to, to argue against. Now both sound wrong. I find it very difficult to hold my own against somebody and that, I believe that comes from the childhood experience that to argue, to disagree with my parents would have brought disapproval. I learned that the best way to react was not to say anything. Because if you said something, anything, even if it was, I'm sorry, there would be a negative reaction. So now I can't argue. I can't get the words out. So I tend to sulk, which is deeply frustrating for a woman of my age, but I can't. The safest thing is to say nothing. And my partner and I have never argued. I actually don't think that's a good thing. Well, I know that's not a good thing because I back away from confrontation. I walk away and I go and pull the duvet over my head and hide. I can't do confrontation. So, I don't feel kind of jealous or anything. I love my nephews and I show them lots of affection, but when I see it, like, it hurts me because I didn't have this experience and I see, like, this is what's natural. So you must be really evil to not show love to your own kids. You must be somebody, like, really evil. What's wrong with you? Why didn't you show love to, to us? When I was their age, what the hell was wrong with you guys? Why were you just angry with me? Of course I'll break things, of course I'll fight in the playground. I was just a kid, you know? <sighs> what was wrong with you? You know? Why were you so, so impatient with me? Why didn't you love me? I think all my life, one of the things I have done is not attempted things because I might fail and failure was unacceptable. It's like I've got a black parrot on my shoulder telling me anything I do isn't good enough and it doesn't allow me to try or get things wrong. I'm scared of getting things wrong, worrying myself sick over failure before I've even failed. I'm not good enough. I can't do this. And another thing I remember thinking very clearly, with work I mean, I did quite well at work, but I was never brave. So the impact, I mean, I think my emotional insecurity has governed my life. So I've never taken on things I think that I might fail at. One of the things that I still struggle with is when people make a judgment of me and it's not a true judgment. They've not seen me as I am. For a long time, I didn't realise what it was, but something would just hit a button in me. And I just thought I was being oversensitive, which I've been accused of by my partner. But I'm learning all the time and understanding where it's coming from. And I think understanding that, it's helping me to deal with things. But I can't stop the switches going on. Like my mum saying to me, what's wrong with you? Why don't people like you? Psychotherapists who've worked with emotionally neglected clients often find that they're reluctant to criticise or blame their parents. 
Some suggest that motherhood is idealised, even sacred in many cultures. So it can be hard to acknowledge that we as mothers, or our own mothers, were less than perfect. At the same time, women may reject the idea that mothers are single-handedly responsible for their child's psychological and emotional well-being, pointing to other influences in the wider social environment. However, without blaming anyone, we can acknowledge what did not go well in our childhood and learn to take our rightful place in the world. But then I think, oh, you know, it wasn't that bad, really. I didn't have that bad a childhood. What am I making such a fuss about? And then I hear myself and I think, yeah, that's straight out of childhood. Don't make a fuss. It wasn't that bad. You've got nothing to worry about. Don't be upset. So that's the way I see it repeating. I can't even allow myself to say how bad it really feels like it was because I have this sort of inner critic telling me not to make a fuss and it's not that bad and other people are far worse off than you. You know, when I look at myself and my brother and my sister, what else would parents want for their children? Why aren't we good enough for you? Why don't you appreciate what you have? None of us are using drugs, none of us, you know, are addicts, all of us are educated, all of us are well-mannered, so what else do you want? Why don't you appreciate us? Why is it not good enough for you? What else do you want? I didn't realise it until I looked back. Because what you experience as a child is your norm. You know, you've got nothing else to compare it to. And it was perhaps only having my own children that I've reflected. And I think, that's not normal. That's not right. I don't feel resentful. I feel really sad. I want to cry because they would, my parents would hate to know how it felt. And I can't say that I had a really unhappy childhood. I had some very happy memories of childhood. But as a child, I remember being aware that, that things weren't right. You can't name it because you don't know. You don't know what's wrong. There's just this overwhelming feeling that something is wrong. And now I have more understanding. Perhaps it wasn't that I was unlovable. It was more that Mum wasn't in a position to love me. She couldn't do it, without any blame of her. I'm sure she was doing the best she could. But it's left me with this feeling. There, there is inside me, somewhere deep inside me, a hard nub that tells me I am not lovable. Unconsciously, in my head, rationally, logically, I can argue it away, tell myself that it's not true. And yet it's there. That feeling is still there.